Hi, welcome to episode 4 of Story Now, Trilogy Time. But before we get into it, let me just make a quick apology for the delay between the last episode and this one. Now, those of you who had seen the review of Thor, The Dark World, know that I promised two episodes before the end of the year. One on person of interest, which, again, this is not that episode. I apologize, but that is coming soon. And the next on the desolation of smog. The plan was that after I got home, I would take some time to recover from jet lag and whatnot, and then use the vacation to record two videos and post them before I got back. Problem is that after I got back, I got sick. Now, while this wasn't in any way debilitating, this did mean that any video that I would record would either be incomprehensible or incredibly distracting with the sneezing, oozing, coughing, etc., etc. So I was forced to hold off until I got better, got back, which eventually became now uh, for the fourth episode. Um, so sorry about the delay, but without further ado, let's get into episode four, Trilogy Time. So the question really is, why are we bombarded with trilogies these days? Every film series we see has to go to number three. The plans are always one movie and then two more in the works. Now, oftentimes when the second movie is dismal, we don't see the third movie, but the talk is always of having a third movie. And the setup is generally of having a third movie. Uh, when we get to movie four, much more often than not, we either see a remake, a prequel, or some huge change like in Rocky IV, where the director changed, structural realism changed, and the focus changed. So, what is it about trilogies that is so attractive? Uh, you even look at, at the Avengers series of films. They made one, which did gangbusters business, and after that they said, they, they did not announce one sequel to that. They did not say that we are, we're, we're starting to lay the foundation for a second Avengers, nor did they say that we're talking about four or five or six. They again focused on that magic number three. They talked about establishing the villains for the third Avengers. They talked about a set storyline that would go through three separate films. Now, some nitpickers would argue that there have already been seven films and that it encompasses, encompasses many different films and franchises, but as a story, as, as discrete units, we have three. We have the bundle of plot points that led to and culminated in Avengers. Then we'll have the bundle of, of plot points and movies that lead up two and culminate in Avengers 2 and presumably the same for three. If you look at all three of those as a unit or if you look at the Avengers franchise outside of, of the individual properties that are attached to it, it's a trilogy. You even look to at, at Iron Man, one of the composite uh, franchises, that too has tapped out at three and Iron Man 4 has been pushed way into the future and is more likely not going to have a new director and uh, sorry, a new lead actor and a new direction altogether. So, as far as trilogies go, why are there so many of them? Well, to understand that, we have to look at act structures, how stories are put into place, and the most popular act structure, the three act structure. So, three-act structure. Now, this is by far the most popular act structure, especially in, in films, uh, where you have a set period of time and a uh, requirement for a basic core of predictability from the audience. Most films, the vast majority of films, and this means practically any film that you're going to be able to go out and see in, in your local theater 
follow the three act structure. Um, and as we're going to discuss, so do series of films, which is why, generally speaking, we have trilogies, because having three films allows you to very easily map out each act uh, of the overarching story onto a film. So if you have a series like Lord of the Rings, you can easily map the first act onto the first film, the second act onto the second film, and the third act onto the third film, and so on and so forth. Um, but in order to understand this, we have to first talk about the three acts and how they function. So the first act is essentially the setup where you explain what's what's going on. You explain who the people are that you're going to be dealing with, uh, what what the world is, any any sort of internal logic that needs to be explained, any mechanism, if there are wizards, what's a wizard, that that sort of thing. Uh, this they also have to explain in the first act what situation your, your characters are in? What situation is the world in? Basically, they explain the status quo and the problem, the initial, the initial impetus for action. That's the first act. Now, depending on the type of film you're dealing with, uh, you know, whether it's fantastical and requires a lot of explanation, or whether it's close to real life, this can can vary from the incredibly expansive, uh, you know, Fellowship of the Ring, which had about 35, 40 minutes of, of just solid world building situation explaining first act, uh, to, you know, incredibly short films like Commando, where the characters are simpler, the situation is easier to digest, and the world operates on, if not exactly real life, on a real life derivable set of rules, uh, on basically the action hero common world. Uh, so in that movie, you get about 10 minutes. Uh, but all of these basically explain where the characters are and what their purpose is through the movies. Sorry, through the, through the story. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, then we get to Act 2. Now, generally speaking, this is going to be the longest act. Now, this is where you get the characters, their situations, and their motivations escalating into some form of conflict. Uh, here's where stakes are raised or defined, where some form of conflict between characters or between characters and the world itself, you know, like a survival movie, uh, is established, and the characters realize they need to overcome something. Now, whether this is um, whether this is something as simple as their own uh, insecurities or something as as large and terrifying as the embodiment of all evil depends on the film and depends on the type of story they're telling but invariably the second act will will create conflict and will escalate the stakes from the setup to to the third act and that's its purpose. Its purpose is to take you and this familiar character, this character that they've built up in the first act, and put it into a situation wherein there's a, th there is some sort of antagonism or some sort of difficulty that needs to be overcome. Uh, something that makes you fear for the characters that you've invested in. And with that, we then come to the third, uh, the third act which is the climax and resolution. Now, all of the, the tension and the conflict that's been built up now finally breaks. Uh, if you're in a horror film, this is where the, the, the alien finally is shown in all of its, its scaly and acid-dripping glory. If you're in a fantastical film, this is when you finally rally your bannermen and charge at the at the the goblin ranks this is if you're 
you know, fighting a rebellion. This is when finally you announce your purpose to the the tyrant leader. Uh, if if you're trying to fight your insecurities, this is when you finally get onto the stage and begin your play. Everything that's been building up here comes to a head. And in essence, this act serves as the decision point. You decide whether the, the characters are going to win or or lose, or if their conflict, their conflict is within each other, who is going to win and lose? Um, actually, uh, the television series Game of Thrones is exceptionally well known for this, wherein characters on both sides or on all three sides of a conflict then have to be decided amongst, and uh, yeah, that's that's what it's known for. And, of course, after that, uh, after it comes to a head, is the resolution. And this is generally, in, in the three-act structure, part of the third act. It's, it's almost like an aside. And once, once the decision point has, has been made and has been passed, the resolution in most, in most stories following the three-act structure is incredibly short and quick. Uh, again, going back to the example of Commando, uh, or actually an even better example, Taken. Here, the, the resolution is, no joke, 30 seconds. Uh, the final confrontation between him and the Sheik, between Liam Neeson and the Sheik is, has taken place. The, the Sheik has met his fate. And the resolution is Liam Neeson walking over to his daughter, hugging her, fade to black. Um... You know, some movies like The Lord of the Rings uh, tend to take this on a little further, uh, like The Return of the King. Um, but generally, this is not not something that can form its own act. And in fact, when Return of the King came out, uh, it received a huge amount of criticism for devoting uh, 15, 15, 20 minutes to the resolution. This is supposed to be part of and actually the smallest part of the third act. So these are the basic, this is the basic three act structure as it applies to a story and as it applies to a single movie actually. Now it's easy to see how this applies to a, a, a three story film. Um, so let's, let's take them individually and, and talk about, uh, as I discussed earlier, the two different types of trilogy and how they, how they function. So first, let's talk about the story with with a built-in hook, uh, the story that's intended to be part of a series. Now, in these, it's incredibly easy to see that, uh, aside from the films having, or you know, in, in in the case of modern films, sometimes not having their in own internal three act structure, uh, there is an overall story that's been planned from the beginning, uh, especially when you're adapting a book like. Uh, the Hunger Games trilogy, you know that there is a series of three in which which together have to tell a whole story. So in this case, you can easily map out uh, what's happening um, over the course of each film as part of a larger story. So you can take your first film... Um, taking the example of The Hobbit, and use that almost exclusively as the first act of a larger story. Uh, and, you know, this, this is done over and in addition to the internal story. The movie still has to function as a movie on its own. It needs a beginning, middle, and end. But on top of that, the whole story acts as a beginning, the end is by no means finite. Uh, the escalation is only part of... The escalation hasn't really ended. Um, and the whole film is spent introducing concepts, ideas, um, and situations. So 
the end of the uh, of the first act in a movie that's designed to have uh, three parts is generally the end of the first act. It's when you finally understand what's going on here, what the stakes are, what everyone's motivations are, who everyone is, and so on and so forth. Uh, it can be that, uh, like in uh, the television series Avatar, the, the first act, which in this case was the first season, introduces as the antagonist the final character, the final piece of the puzzle. Then you go on to the second, the second film. Again, similarly, the whole film can be used as an escalation. The beginning is, is jumping off from the end of the first, is raising the stakes. And as, as we talked about in the second act, you basically use the second film as a whole uh, to bridge where the first film was, what the stakes of the first film was, with the final deciding point in the end. And uh, as I discussed in the Catching Fire review, uh, this is an incredibly difficult task. Um, but it's a little bit easier in these types of trilogies than in the follow-up franchises. And, of course, then you've got your third film, where the overall conflict that's been in the background of the films, that's been driving the action of the, of the characters from film one's three acts and film two's three acts up until this movie. So the first act of this movie then essentially functions as a recap and as basically that final step before before the confrontation. And the majority of this film is, is dedicated to the war, to the battle, to that final deciding point. Um, this is why, to a large extent, actually, The Return of the Jedi was such a disappointing film, because it failed to do that. It failed to, to build upon and conclude the escalation in Empire. Uh, instead, it just reverted back to the first film as if it was a standalone. But that's a discussion for another day. So that's how, how the three-act structure can be applied to a series if you know that it's going to be a series from the outset. And the main distinction lies in your ability to plan out the first film as the first act. And this is where a lot of follow-up franchises have a tough, tough deal. Because, you know, look at Back to the Future. In Back to the Future, you have a, a kid basically fighting for his own existence uh, and overcoming it while changing his, his family's fortune and the nature of his parents' relationship. And that was the struggle of the second, second Back to the Future movie because in order to function as a proper three-act story, it needed to treat that whole story arc as merely an introduction. Now, it, it, it was able to work this uh, to greater or later lesser ex effect, but that's the main distinction between follow-up films and trilogies. But even in follow-up films, which have a harder time of doing it, they do tend to focus on a three a three act or three film structure. This is because, generally speaking, it's easier to sell an overarching story than it is rehashes or just sequences of films. Uh, if you say that uh, Star Wars is the story of people defeating the Empire. Now, we've been talking about the three-act structure, but that's not to say that this is the only act structure that exists. Um, we, can, we can talk about a, a one-act structure, which is essentially what the vast majority of short films and vignettes are. In essence, that's just one scene or sequence uh, that sort of exists on its own and that doesn't really depend on 
characters or a journey. It's more about an observation, a situation, or an idea. Uh, anything that can be boiled down to one sentence is generally a one-act structure. Uh, you could also make the argument that a lot of bad films are one-act structures. Uh, movies where nothing happens, the film goes nowhere. That's because the whole time it was just build-up or existence. Then you have two-act structures. Now, the most common example of a two-act structure is a joke, uh, where you have the build-up and payoff. You don't really need any form of escalation. Uh, there's a situation, and then there's the humorous turn. So uh, you tend to see this in smaller, more humorous uh, story forms, or, in fact, in, in vignettes and an anecdotes. Uh, then, of course, you have the three-act structure. Now, the thing is, generally stories that go beyond the three-act structure are usually variations on the three-act structure. Um, now, some complicated novels break this, but uh, if, you, if you look in deeper, generally there's, they're, they're sticking to some variation of the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, books are generally the best place where you can avoid this, but the fact is that even if you can't break down the art form into discrete parts, say you have a TV show of seven seasons, you can still identify points at which there is that overarching first arc, that overarching second arc, and that overarching third arc, which in themselves form acts. Um, and in cases where this doesn't happen, oftentimes you end up feeling unsatisfied or feeling that there was no overarching story. Uh, partly this may be because the three-act structure is so pervasive that uh, to many people that seems like the only way to tell a story. That if you don't have a payoff at the end, it's not one story, it's just a bunch of smaller stories stuck together. Uh, the validity of this is a controversial issue and probably doesn't matter to most people who generally expect a three-act structure. That being said, I do believe there's room for a hypothetical fourth act, and I'm taking this off from The Lord of the Rings. To a large extent, the book, although the film's fairly long resolution could qualify as a fourth act itself. Now, the fourth act, you've gone through your three acts. You've gone through the setup of the world and the characters, the escalation and the raising of the stakes, and the final confrontation. Now, I believe that there's room uh, for a fourth act, for the resolution or the fallout to be its own separate act, uh, where you have that final confrontation, but then you have to deal with the fact that uh, that the world or you yourself had to go through that second act. Uh, the third act in many ways pays off the first act, but you could argue that the second act doesn't really have any payoff because the second act went into transforming the world from the first act to the third act. Now, this doesn't mean literally transforming the world. Again, we're not just talking about grand wars or earth-shattering magics. This can even be the world as seen through the, the eyes of the viewer or the world as seen through the eyes of the main character. But the fact that they're separate is never really addressed because the movie generally cuts off at or close to that decision point. Um, and this is actually something that's, that's made a, a lot of Russian authors or old classical authors incredibly successful at their at lingering in the mind they tend to take an a bit of time another act if you will to re-examine the world to examine where you are 
even if you look at a short novel like uh, Camus' Outsider, arguably you have your three-act structure where you have uh, the apathetic protagonist, you have uh, his friendship with, uh, with a neighbor that eventually culminates in his arrest, and then you have the, the trial process and the decision point through which he's condemned. But after that, there is a section which discusses the fallout from that decision, um, which examines the fact that the character is in a completely different position than he was in the beginning and has to reconcile himself with the new new world. Now, I'm not saying that the, the four-act structure uh, should replace the three-act structure or could replace the three-act structure. I think in a lot of places, lingering on the resolution cheapens the decision point. But I do believe there's room for, for films or television, which so far have seemed fairly rigid in adopting the three-act structure, uh, if including certain, certain complications or twists and turns within, to adopt a fourth act wherein you reconcile the fact that the world isn't the same, the characters aren't the same, and that the decision point was actually a crucible. Uh, this could actually help further tie in the story to the innate sense of realism uh, of, of the audience. Uh, in real life, if there is something that's built, some sort of conflict or confrontation that's built up to, after that conflict or confrontation is resolved, everything doesn't simply revert back to how it was in the beginning. And you certainly don't have a fade to black. Uh, if you have, if you stand up to a bully in a, in, in a, in fisticuffs, generally there will be casts or injuries or principles to account, uh, account with. And I think that showing that stage may actually be an interesting way to, to move forward in, in storytelling in the, the visual media. So that was episode four of Story Now. Um, we Just a look at the three-act structure as a possible explanation for why we have so many trilogies in, in films these days. Um, so I'll be posting again as soon as I can. Uh, for those people who wanted to look at The Desolation of Smog, unfortunately, I won't be posting about that movie. I've realize that I may not be the most objective person when it comes to uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and that means that I won't have very much to say that'd be of, of use. Um, personally, I'd recommend it if you, liked, uh, if you liked the first one or if you liked Lord of the Rings. It's a good movie. It's arguably better or worse than the first one depending on how you came out of the first one. Um, but I will, after this, be taking a look at the long-promised Person of Interest episode. Um, and that's about, that's about all I've got on my docket. I may think of something else later on. And if you have any suggestions or comments or angry retorts, please feel free to fill the comment, comment box. If you like this video, recommend it to a friend, subscribe, share, uh, do all those things that, that make people watch the videos. Uh, thanks for watching.